On December 3, 1976, a car full of gunmen entered the home of Bob Marley and shot everyone on sight. Marley, the pride and joy of Jamaica, was almost killed in his own country, and to this day, people are still trying to make sense of what happened. Jamaica's capital city of Kingston was not the nicest place to live in in the late 1970s. The country had only become independent from the British in the 1960s, and they were left a deeply unequal and impoverished nation. It was full of poverty-stricken neighborhoods called garrisons, many of which had been taken over by violent gangs. It had a population of only 2 million people, but roughly 20,000 were fleeing the country every year. 50% of its people were illiterate, and 5% of the country owned 90% of its wealth. It was not the Caribbean paradise that was being advertised to tourists. The lives of ordinary Jamaicans contrasted sharply with the career of Bob Marley, who had seen unprecedented success throughout the 60s and 70s. In 1976, he released his album Rastaman Vibration, which peaked at number 8 on the US Albums chart. That same year, Marley wanted to give something back to the people of Jamaica. A year beforehand, Stevie Wonder organized a benefit concert for blind children in Jamaica, and Bob Marley wanted to do something similar. In the end, he decided to set up a free concert called Smile Jamaica, and a song would be released with the same name. This was at a time when Jamaica's political climate was incredibly intense, and who you voted for was seen as a fundamental part of your identity. The Jamaican writer Marlon James said, In my grandmother's house, there, are there were photos of the prime minister and the prime minister's father. There are no family photos. That's how far the sort of political culture is ingrained. What's more, politicians and local gangs often colluded together to exercise control over these neighborhoods. Jamaica's then prime minister, Michael Manley, was a polarizing figure and proposed his own brand of socialism. Bob Marley somewhat supported him during his election in 1972, but by 1976, when an election was on the horizon, he decided to keep his distance and did not offer him any endorsement. In the 1974 song Revolution, Bob Marley sings, Never make a politician grant you a favor, he'll always want to control you forever. It's believed that Marley was talking about Manley in this song. Roger Steffens, who has written several books on Marley, said that Bob and his band realized that Manley had let them down and they were being used. He said, They did think Manley, being a progressive and practically a socialist, was going to change things for Rasta, for keeping them from being targets from police, and he was going to legalize marijuana. Neither of those things really took place. So that's where that line grew. Never make a politician grant you a favor. He'll always want to control you forever. That was directly to Manley. Despite Bob's wishes to become politically neutral, Manley and his election opponent, Edward Sega, wanted to get in on the good publicity surrounding the Smile Jamaica concert. Both politicians offered their support, and Manley even offered to hold the event on the lawns at Jamaica House, the Prime Minister's official residence. But Bob wanted it to be a politically neutral event, so it was held in the National Heroes Park. However, Marley's wishes to be neutral were not fulfilled. Once the concert was organized on December 5th, Manley brought forward the election date to a few days after the concert, and this gave the impression that the show was in support of Manley. Added to that, this concert was co-sponsored by the Ministry of Culture, giving the impression that Bob was working on this event with the current government. Ultimately, Bob Marley's hands were tied. If he tried to cancel the concert, this would also be seen as a political move. Marley knew that he had been co-opted by Manley, but there was little or nothing he could do about it. And even the song Smile Jamaica was interpreted as an endorsement of Manley. To have such an optimistic song about Jamaica at this time suggested that Marley was happy with the way things were and where they were going, and Marley wanted Manley to continue as Prime Minister for another term. A review of the track from Richard Johnson said, Is this the same universal rebel who is now saying, can't criticize, oh smile in Jamaica? What about the African dream and the African redemption? Has the Rasta rebel now become a quote, responsible citizen? Adding an extra layer to the tension was the Cold War between the USA and the Soviet Union. Manley was a left-leaning politician and had visited the communist country of Cuba a year before. His opponent, the right-leaning Edward Siga, was nicknamed Edward Siaega because it was rumored that the Secret Service was supporting his campaign out of fear that Jamaica would become a communist state. I'll get into the CIA's alleged involvement a little bit later. At the time, Marley and his entourage were living at 56 Hope Road, a mansion where he and his label Tough Gong stayed, rehearsed, and made music. It was agreed by gangs across Kingston that this was a neutral spot and any violence was strictly off limits. But after the announcement of the Smile Jamaica concert, Bob started receiving death threats. 
To counteract this, Bob was now given security by Michael Manley's own political party. This protected him but did little to erase any doubts that he was a politically neutral person. And two days before the concert, it became clear that Bob had some enemies. Unexpected visitors would arrive at Bob Marley's house at 9 p.m. that night, and Jamaica would never be the same again. When describing the scene, Roger Steffens said, Two white Datsun compacts drove through the gates of Tough Gong, from which the longtime guards had mysteriously disappeared. The exact number of gunmen who came leaping out, guns blazing, is a subject of controversy. There could have been as many as seven or eight, armed with machine guns and pistols, some reportedly containing homemade bullets. They went room to room, often firing wildly. Tyron Downey, a musician who was in the house, said, I couldn't believe I was actually witnessing this. And then when we really realized that that was a gun and someone was firing, we all hit the ground and just headed. The only way we could go was toward the bathroom. And we all went in there and we were waiting for them to come in and finish us off. When asked where Bob Marley was, Downey said, Bob had stepped out because the horns weren't on that record and the horn players wanted to play on it. So we were working all the horn parts and Bob got bored from hearing the da da da. He came out of the rehearsal room and went into the kitchen to get a grapefruit or something. His manager, Don Taylor, had just arrived and went round there to talk to him. While Marley was eating a grapefruit in the kitchen, a gunman came in, saw Bob in the corner and fired. The bullet grazed his chest and lodged into his arm. Bob was exhaling at the time, and had he been inhaling, the bullet would have lodged in his heart and killed him. Don Taylor was shot five times, while Bob Marley's wife, Rita, was shot in the head while driving her car in the front yard. The gunman fled the scene. They could be heard shouting, did you get him? Yeah, I shot him. They managed to get away before the police arrived soon after. Don Taylor was flown to Miami where he underwent surgery and survived the attack, and miraculously, Rita Marley's dreadlocks ended up softening the impact of the bullets, and she survived too. There were no casualties on that night, but there was a sense that things had changed. According to Marlon Johnson, in Jamaica 1976, there's always a shooting somewhere, but you knew some line had been crossed. Something was different. There was a fear in people's voices. He also said, Killing Marley was and is so preposterous. There's an unwritten rule in Jamaica that nobody touches the tough gall. After the shooting, Marley and his entourage sought refuge in Strawberry Hill, a scenic and secluded part of the island. He did not want to do the concert, but was persuaded that if he didn't, he would be doing exactly what his attackers wanted. If he showed them that he was still willing to perform after being shot, it would send out a powerful message. So, the Smile Jamaica concert goes ahead, and Bob plays to an electrified audience. Halfway through the show, he ripped open his shirt and showed his bullet wound to the audience. His legendary status just accelerated up another gear. But the reality was that Bob was no longer safe in Jamaica. And the next day he fled to London, England. Everything started right here in England. Here he composed his now legendary album Exodus, and given all that has happened, it's within this context that he releases his famous hit, Three Little Birds. Despite having narrowly escaped an assassination attempt, he's singing the lyrics, don't worry about a thing, cause every little thing is gonna be all right. Back in Jamaica, Michael Manley unanimously won the election. And with the dust settled from that fateful night, the big question was, who tried to kill Bob Marley? One theory is that the shootings had nothing to do with the elections whatsoever, and were down to one of Bob's friends. According to Stefan, his best friend, Alan Skill Cole, a famous soccer player, fixed a race at a racetrack. He burned the Jamaican Mafia for a million dollars, so they were out to kill him and he fled the country. He eventually surfaced as the manager of the Ethiopian soccer team. He was out of the country for a good deal of time, so Bob was paying off some of his debt. Every day, people from the gangs, the Mafia, would come to Tough Gong and he would give them a little more money, and they were demanding that they would pay off this debt for his best friend. That may have been the motivation for the shooting. Most people pointed the finger at gangs affiliated with the Jamaica Labor Party. At the same time, why did the guards from the People's National Party disappear on the night? For both political parties, Bob Marley was a power threat. Marlon James contends that Bob Marley at this time was seen by many people in Jamaica as dangerous. He said, The idea that this guy with this, you know, uncombed hair speaking terribly, becoming this voice of freedom and black struggle, a lot of Jamaicans were very uncomfortable with that. We would love to say that we were on the forefront of accepting Bob Marley as a revolutionary. We're actually one of the last. And of course, you may have heard the age-old theory that the CIA tried to kill Bob Marley. Edward Sega flatly denies that he ever worked with the CIA. 
Something that added a lot of weight to this theory is a rather strange coincidence. Someone who made documentary films about Bob Marley in the 1970s was a filmmaker named Carl Colby, and he happened to be the son of William Colby, the head of the CIA. However, Carl was upfront about who his dad was when connecting with Bob and his entourage. The most tangible piece of evidence is that the CIA had a file on Bob Marley and described him as subversive. That being said, the CIA has files on other musicians like Elvis, Jimi Hendrix, and John Lennon. The Secret Service seemed to keep files on many outspoken figures. Stefan is incredibly skeptical of the idea that the CIA were involved and said, I'm no fan of the CIA, and I would love to find solid proof that somehow the CIA was involved in that assassination attempt, but I've been unable to. And because I have denied that, I've been accused of being a CIA agent myself. People do take that seriously. If I could find one scintilla of verifiable evidence that the CIA gave the order to kill Bob Marley, I would be shouting it from the rooftops. It would be the opening line of my biography of Bob, but I can't. Skeffen concludes, I think ultimately it was a gang of young gunmen from the Jamaican Labor Party who had heard that Edward Sega, the head of the party, didn't want the concert to go on and they took it upon themselves. After the shooting, the gunmen were seen going back to Tivoli Gardens, a neighborhood run by a gang called the Shower Posse, who supported Edward Sega's Labor Party. It would not be another two years until Marley would return back to his homeland to perform. He only agreed to this after receiving sworn agreements from certain gang leaders that he would be safe. By 1978, Marley performed on stage in Kingston once again. The concert contained Jamaica's most prominent musicians, Bob Marley and Peter Tosh. In the middle of the concert, rival gang leaders were seen embracing each other on stage. And during his own performance, Bob invited two people onto that stage, Prime Minister Michael Manley and his 1976 opponent, Edward Sega. Bob sang, show the people you love him right, and show the people you're gonna unite, and got them both to shake hands on stage. This was a beautiful moment, but sadly, it was not the happily ever after scene that Jamaica was looking for. The two gang leaders who embraced each other on stage would be shot dead within the next two years. Peter Tosh, the second most prominent reggae artist in Jamaica, would also be shot dead a few years later. Bob also sadly passed away from melanoma, a form of skin cancer, in 1981. Reflecting on this moment in 1978, Jamaican journalist Melville Cook wrote, Think of peace and unity concerts as largely performer-driven suggestions for social harmony and an indication of what the society can be. With the requisite support through focused societal programs, efficient unbiased policing, reduced corruption, and caring beyond socioeconomic class, song and dance cannot do that, but it can and does indicate possibilities. Make sure to subscribe for more.